Good morning and welcome to this, the 21st meeting of 2014 of the European and External Relations Committee. Can I make the usual request that mobile phones are switched off and can I make an immediate apology for keeping people waiting? We had uh, a wee technical difficulty, so um, as I say, welcome and we will go straight into our uh, first agenda item. And the first agenda item this morning is a discussion on the new session of the European Parliament. And I'm delighted to have with us today five of our six MEPs by video conference. We have Dr Ian Duncan. Welcome back to committee, Dr Duncan, but on the other side of the table this time. Um, to Ian Hudgeton. Um, welcome, uh, Mr Hudgeton. And to David Martin. Welcome to you. And that's our Brussels contingent and it, with us today in committee we have Catherine Styler, welcome Catherine, and David Coburn, welcome Mr Coburn um, to committee this morning. Alan Smith has tendered his apologies but he has set written evidence which you have in your papers. Um, can I thank you all for your written evidence? I know we have a tight time scale this morning and you all have to be uh, at different places so we are we're, we're going to move quite quickly on this. A wee bit of etiquette for, for the room, the video conference is a slight time lag so um, if you know we can just ensure that we allow that few seconds time for the the transmission to go forward and for us to then uh, be able to to respond to that that would be very helpful um, I'm going to um, basically uh, go straight to questions but hopefully uh, my opening question will allow each of you to give um, a, a, an, an overview of the work that you're currently undertaking. I'm going to start with the Brussels um, uh, contingent this morning because it allows us just to, to deal with that time lag and get used to it, used to it first. Um, so um, starting with, with, with yourself uh, uh, Dr Duncan because that's where I'm going to start just to put you on the spot and I'm delighted to do so and congratulations on your election. Um, it, for, for all of, all of the, the MEPs with us this morning, one of the things we're obviously very keen on is what's happening in Brussels now. We've had the election. We've had the new College of Commissioners elected. Um, what's the sort of a political impetus there? But personally, what's, what work are you involved in as far as what committees and, and what you know, pieces of work you're involved in that you think are coming over the horizon that will have an impact on Scotland? And if we could start with yourself, Dr Duncan, and go. We've got two Davids and two Eans this morning, so I'm trying to stick to surnames for, for, for the men, basically. <laughs> um, so if we could start with you, Dr Duncan, that would allow us to get kicked off. Well, Madam President, it's a pleasure to see you from this side. Um, the last time I was doing this, I would be the nervous person at the back trying to make sure the link actually worked. But it's quite nice to be sitting here watching it all unfold. Um, it's an exciting time to be in Brussels right now. Um, we are still in the early stages of the new session. So in truth, it's still settling down. The Commission has just really come into um, office. And so we're working through broadly legacy issues, which are holdovers from the previous mandate. Um, we expect around the 15th or so of December to get the Commission's work programme, and that will give us, again, a strong indication of the next five years and exactly where the issues are going to be and when they will unfold. Uh, and I know that your team will be on top of that. Uh, in terms of where I sit here, I now sit on uh, three committees. One is a full member, which is the Envy, the Environment and Public Health Committee. I also am a substitute on the Fisheries Committee, uh, alongside Ian Hudgeton. And I am a substitute on the, the Energy, the, the ITRA committee. Uh, priorities for me right now, there are some legacy issues, as I've said. Uh, in terms of fisheries, the landing obligation is a serious concern to me. Um, you'll be aware the discard ban comes in for the first fisheries on the 1st of January 2015, which is important. That's the pelagic fisheries. The landing obligation give the legal underpinnings to this particular discard ban, and though those underpinnings are not there. Uh, the proposals are not ready for the 1st of January. There will be no enforceability until that is signed off, and that will be sometime in the middle of next year. So for the first part, Scottish fishermen are going to be without the certainty of uh, the law, which is a bad thing. Um, there is some other information in terms of fisheries in the note that I sent you, so I won't go into that in any detail. If I can touch upon one other aspect which I'm going to be leading on, I'm part of the Parliament's delegation out to the UN uh, Climate Change Conference in Lima. Now, I know Scotland has quite a tale to tell in terms of its commitment to climate change and to energy. Uh, I would be very interested to hear from you about what you would like me to be taking out there. I'll be sitting again with the Scottish Government and the UK Government to make sure that those views are held and incorporated, and I will be reporting back. But that will be an important first step, where we will get a sense of where uh, the commitments to climate change are heading, uh, our ability to secure that two-degree reduction uh, in overall um, global temperature. I will leave it there. There is more information, of course, in my note, but I'm very happy to take questions on any aspect of that. 
Thank you. OK, what I'll do is we'll go, go to all the members first and get their overview, and we can come back to questions. Um, uh, Mr Martin, do you, would you be ready to go next? Yeah. Yep, good morning. Um, as Ian rightly says, we don't yet have the political guidelines or the political work programme for the European Commission, but we have clear priorities that we want included in that work programme. Uh, we want, firstly, uh, the focus of this new commission to be on jobs, growth and investment, because we think that's the, the crucial area for Europe at the present time, getting the whole continent out of austerity. So we want to ensure that the youth guarantee scheme that already exists is properly spent and implemented. We have, we know, although it's not yet formally been announced, but we know the Commission are going to uh, announce a 300 billion pound investment, 300 billion euro investment in the European economy uh, as a result of pressure from my own group when Mr. Juncker uh, came before us for endorsement. And uh, more recently, perhaps no coincidence because of the uh, debate about tax in Luxembourg, uh, the Commission, I think, are now going to include uh, something in their work programme on tackling tax avoidance, uh, which is interesting that that announcement should come at this stage. Um, but beyond that, uh, we can all guess what will be in the Commission's work programme, but we don't have it yet. But in my own area, I do most of my work on three committees, trade, foreign affairs and human rights, and I want to focus particularly on trade because it's going to be, it was in the previous Parliament, and in this parliament is going to be, again, one of the busiest uh, committees. We have, towards the end of the last parliament, completed the South Korean, Central American and Colombia-Peru free trade agreements. We already have uh, the outcome of the first year or so of implementation of the South Korean free trade agreement. And the news there is both good for Scotland and good for the European Union in that uh, EU uh, exports to Korea went up far more than imports from South Korea as a whole, and Scottish whisky in particular did rather well out of the change of the tax regime and the uh, protection that was given as a result of the, the free trade agreement. So good news for Scotland there. We have completed free trade agreements, or the Commission has completed free trade agreements with Singapore and Canada, which the European Parliament will have to ratify uh, sometime in the next year to 18 months. It takes a long time because it has to go through what they have to go through what's called legal scrubbing to make sure that the texts are legally watertight uh, and they have to be translated, unfortunately, into 24 languages. The Canada and Singapore is also good news for us because uh, the Commission were robust in insisting on GI's geographical indicators being included in these free trade agreements, which is important, as you will know, for a number of Scottish uh, products. Uh, and again, uh, they're both good markets for not just um, whiskey, but for other Scottish pro products like textiles and so on. So uh, it's encouraging these um, FTAs are being completed. We have to wait for the ratification process. I won't go into any detail, but we also have ongoing uh, FTAs with Japan, Vietnam, Ecuador, Malaysia, India. Uh, we have investment agreements being negotiated with Myanmar and with China. But probably the big one that people will know most about is so-called TTIP, the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership with the uh, United States. Uh, that has been very controversial. Uh, you perhaps get others who will say I'm wrong on this, but I have to say, having looked at, we're not. There's nothing on paper on TTIP. We're only negotiating, so there's no final text. But from speaking to negotiators on both sides, I personally do not believe there's any threat to our health service as a result of TTIP. There's been a lot of talk in the press that TTIP will damage uh, our health care. I don't believe that is uh, going to be the case. There is worry about something called investor state dispute, which is a mechanism which allows big corporations to sue behind closed doors if they think their investments have been unduly discriminated against. Uh, my own group in the parliament is absolutely against the idea that investor state dispute should be in any trade agreement. But on the, on, on the whole, if we can get a good TTIP, again, we believe it would be good for the Scottish economy and good for the European economy uh, as a whole. Uh, finally, and very briefly, there are a number of other issues that are not particularly germane to Scotland, but are, are important issues. We're trying to update the anti-torture and tr uh, torture regulation and the dual use regulation. We have a, a very important file that a lot of Scottish NGOs have been engaged in, which is the file on conflict minerals, which is about uh, four minerals that are most commonly associated with, with conflict in the world and trying to uh, manage those. Uh, we are 
extending our GSP Plus scheme, which is a scheme of preferential access to the European market, and the Philippines uh, are next in line. And of course, we've been trying to help Ukraine show solidarity with Ukraine in terms of giving them trade preferences in the light of the problems they're facing with their big neighbour at the present time. Many other issues, but I'll stop at that. Thank you very much. Mr Hudgeton. Thank you very much uh, for this opportunity and uh, congratulations on managing to get five out of six into one meeting. That's a record so far in this parliament. And um, I certainly look forward to you know, future um, relations uh, again with the uh, members in the, the Scottish Parliament. Um, you've had a pretty good overview of many of the issues that I mentioned in my uh, paper as well, uh, just to confirm that I'm uh, still a uh, continuing full member of the Fisheries Committee, which I've been for all of the time I've been uh, here uh, in the European Parliament. And like Ian, I have, Ian Duncan, I have concerns about now that we've finished with the structure and the so-called reform of the common fisheries policy, uh, the test of that um, uh, suitability for purpose is going to be in the implementation. And we do have a, a looming uh, controversy, to say the least, about how the um, discard ban um, is to be implemented. And um, I, I think there appears to be growing um, views within the committee um, that I think Ian Duncan and I share that uh, instead of, as the Commission and indeed the Council want to do, having an omnibus regulation which tries to wrap up um, and foresee a whole range of what they call legal um, tidy up uh, measures uh, now, uh, that we should in fact be treating uh, the application of the discard ban or the landing obligation on a fishery by fishery basis at the time when it's due to be uh, implemented and uh, therefore uh, focusing uh, very directly on the very different nature of uh, different fisheries that will be involved. And the reason for starting with the pelagic, which is the one that's due to be uh, implemented from the 1st of January coming, is that, relatively speaking, it is a clean fishery and it's not the biggest problem fishery with uh, unwanted catches and therefore discards. So that's uh, uh, my uh, attitude to, to our current discussion in committee and in parliament here is that we should just be focusing on um, the, those uh, parts of the, the discard ban that come in uh, on, the, on the 1st of January and that we look very more carefully at the complicated and difficult nature of how to apply it to the mixed uh, whitefish fishery, which is also very important uh, in uh, Scotland. On the TTIP, and, uh, uh, we've all had, I think, and perhaps yourselves as well, a significant uh, mailbag from constituents expressing concerns of all kinds about this. Uh, proposal and uh, the, that um, range of concerns has not really been helped uh, by the nature of the uh, of the negotiations so far and the, uh, what you might call the secretive nature of negotiations so far. And it's only by pressure uh, from MEPs and others uh, that we've recently had the negotiating mandate published and uh, there's now some talk about further uh, documentation being made available to all MEPs rather than just a select number who are involved in a particular uh, committee. So I think a, a bit more openness would be very helpful about that. But those who say, and uh, you know, the UK government, for example, say, don't worry, there's nothing in here to um, upset the uh, health service and its uh, public nature. Well, if that's the case, personally, I'd prefer that to be written in as a guarantee rather than given as a verbal assurance, uh, because often these ag agreements or all kinds of European agreements are um, based on so much compromise that the, the interpretation uh, can be uh, somewhat flexible, to say the least, in many cases. So if, uh, if there's no intention of, of, of uh, affecting public services through this agreement, then let's uh, make sure that the wording of it is categoric and clear about that. Uh, otherwise, uh, we have um, just um, seen the new Commission uh, take office and have its first meetings, and already there it's facing a, a motion of censure in the European Parliament, which I think might be considered next week, um, partly based on the, the Luxembourg tax uh, situation that uh, uh, has uh, been 
the cause of some further uh, attacks on uh, President Juncker. Uh, I don't think the motion of censure will succeed, uh, and I think that at this stage, um, I certainly on the on the particular subject of that um, the tax issues in Luxembourg and so on, President Juncker made very clear at our plenary here in Brussels last week that there is to be a commission investigation into uh, these uh, allegations in Luxembourg and in some other places, that he personally will have nothing to do with that inquiry, that the commissioner concerned will be fully independent uh, in conducting that inquiry. So I think the a motion of censure on the commission is somewhat uh, premature at this stage, although, of course, um, the commission is indeed on trial anyway. Uh, many of us had reservations about uh, uh, some aspects of the uh, of individuals uh, as well as the makeup of the team. And it's an interesting new structure in the Commission. And rather than uh, 27 different uh, sets of responsibility, uh, President Juncker has grouped uh, five vice presidents and given them broader uh, portfolios with other commissioners then um, reporting uh, through, uh, through the vice presidents uh, in, in logical, supposedly, um, policy groupings. And it, uh, I think that's worth a try, uh, uh, but it remains to be seen how uh, or whether it will be more successful than uh, past uh, uh, colleges of commissioners. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. And bringing us back to Scotland now, Mr Coburn. Thank you for inviting me here. It's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, well, UKIP won the European election, as you all know, and um, I was elected from Scotland, which shows that uh, just as many folk in Scotland are vexed by the European Union as are vexed in England. And uh, a recent poll came out saying just that. There's something between 35% uh, in favour, 45% against. So that's a very small margin. As we get more exposure in the press in Scotland, that will no doubt narrow. Um, I'm on the Fisheries Committee, the Pesh Committee, and also the Energy Committee. Um, uh, obviously, I, I won't continue to go on about it. We've already discussed uh, the fact that there are problems with landing obligations. Um, the committee doesn't seem to understand the problems of uh, Scottish fishermen bobbing out about in the North Sea. Um, you know, it's uh, what they pass in Brussels is not near, is not actually act, able to be utilised on the boat. I mean, it's a, uh, you know, they've created laws that are probably unenforceable and very difficult for Scottish fishermen to make a living out of. Uh, as for energy, UKIP are opposed, as, as you all know, to ugly German windmills all over our countryside, which are destroying our tourist trade and don't provide any energy. They just push up the prices for Scottish pensioners for power. Uh, which is not very good, and at the same time, we still need some sort of backup when the wind doesn't blow, uh, i.e. nuclear. So um, the other problems I see coming up, of course, is TTIP, which I disagree with my colleagues. I think it is a problem for the National Health Service. Um, I don't uh, think that these negotiations should be conducted by, by the European Union. These conduct businesses with America should be conducted by the United Kingdom government, and it should not be done in Europe. Uh, the Commission continues to be unelected. Basically, we're living under an unelected oligarchy in Brussels, uh, which has appointed uh, some very dubious and odd characters. Uh, Herr Junkers himself is now, as you have heard, under investigation over uh, dodgy dealings uh, when he was, uh, alleged dodgy dealings, when he was the uh, Prime Minister of uh, Luxembourg. Uh, we remain to see what, what that's going to bring out. Uh, there have been calls for his resignation. Uh, the budget, as you know, in the European Union is still not signed off after 19 years, which I don't think inspires confidence. I don't think it's a very good organization of which we, an organization of which we should be a member. Um, at an EU meeting, I managed to get Herr Juncker to agree with um, his colleague, previous uh, President Barroso, that it will be five years before an independent Scotland, if ever th such a thing happened, can enter the EU. And it must accept the euro, which has bankrupted southern Europe, Greece, Spain, Portugal, and now France. Uh, this is obviously very worrying for Scots, and one of the reasons why I think so many of them voted against separation. Um, I will continue in the European Union uh, to fight for the cause of Scotland. I will make sure that as little interference as possible is inflicted on our people. And I will point out to business and the fishing industry and the agricultural industry 
and Scots in general, the problems they face being ruled by Brussels. I also happen to be very worried about what will happen to the Edinburgh financial services industry and the, and the financial service industry in London. Um, the, the Frankfurt is extremely keen to have that, and the European Union will do everything they can to see that that is the case. Uh, we need to be very worried about the European Union in general because, quite frankly, most of our laws are passed there. Uh, you good ladies and gentlemen um, are obtaining money by deception because all the decisions for this country, and so, are, so is Westminster, because the money, uh, all the decisions are being made in Brussels. Okay? Um, I think I've made my position clear on the European Union, and I hope you all see the light and join UKIP. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Catherine Styler. Thank you. Thank you, um, Madam Convener. Um, I, I think that many of my colleagues have already outlined our concern and our priorities on jobs, investment and growth. And uh, I'd add to what David Martin said about the importance about the Youth Guarantee Scheme um, is exceedingly important. Of course, we do not know yet what the Commission's work programme will be. We'll have that very quickly. We've got kind of ideas about on the jobs and growth package, but uh, we will be able to have a fuller discussion once we have that in front of us. But you've asked us specifically to talk a wee bit about the work that we're doing. I'm Vice Chair of the Internal Market Committee, uh, <coughs> which also includes consumer protection. And with the new remit that it has on the digital single market, this is very important to uh, economic growth and also to our citizens. And there are too many barriers in the digital single market. There are now two commissioners who've got responsibility on digital. Commissioner Ansip and Commissioner Uttinger. We're very lucky to have Commissioner Ansip, who was the former Prime Minister in Estonia. And the hearing, they said, you know, Estonia with Estonia. And um, the fact that he knows and it's in his bones about what needs to happen to make digital a reality across the European Union. And I think it's a very, very exciting time. In fact, just yesterday, we had Sir Tim berner Lees come and talk to uh, the IMCO. Uh, there's actually other people, other MEPs were allowed to come along as well. And it was inspiring talking to him, the, you know, the founder of the World Wide Web, about the importance about uh, net neutrality and the importance of having an open web. And I think when people like Sir Tim come and talk about the importance at a European level that we have to fight for those ideals, I think it's so important. In terms of the practical day-to-day -day stuff, I have responsibility as Rapporteur on Intellectual Property Rights in the Internal Market Committee. I was responsible for the budget in the Internal Market Committee for 2015. And the Standing Rapporteur on Construction Products, I continue the work I did in the previous mandate into this mandate. I am also Rapporteur on uh, Gas Appliances. You might not think that is uh, of, of a key interest to people in Scotland, but if you've got a gas fire or a gas cooker, you want to make sure it's safe when you buy it really important and also added to that is energy efficiency and in the I'm a substitute member in the Econ Committee and I would have to disagree with Mr Coburn about the, uh, the importance of the European Union and financial services as the standing rapporteur on Solvency 2 which is vital to our insurance industry I've got the privilege of being the rapporteur and seeing that through uh, and also I'm the shadow rapporteur on insurance mediation I'm also on the EEFTA delegation and a substitute on the American delegation. So thank you for your time, Madam Convener. Thank you uh, very much. Uh, I could see um, both my colleagues, Willie Coffey, getting very excited about the digital stuff and my fellow girl geek, um, Claire Adamson, getting very excited about um, the... Um, the, the scientist aspect of, of the World Wide Web. They, they'll come back to you with questions. I have absolutely no doubt about that. I'm going to kick off questions from our open committee from Jamie McGregor, because Jamie's got some specific questions on some of the written evidence, um, and then we'll open it out to other members. Jamie. Uh, yes, well, thank you very much, and I'd like to thank all the um, MEPs for sending their um, statements. Um, just referring to, to uh, Dr Duncan's uh, statement, Ian, I should probably call him, um, you refer to the loss of the role of the chief scientific advisor, who was actually Scottish from our growth, and uh, you make the point um, that you have concerns. Uh, you know that um, this is this is a retrograde step. Uh, could you comment on that further? And is there any chance of th this this role being replaced? Well, if I may call you Jamie. Um, indeed, I think there is a serious problem unfolding here. Um, Anne Glover is a, a notable scientist. She was Scotland's chief scientist. Uh, she took that role and applied it to the whole of Europe. 
her work and her contribution has been significant. Um, President Juncker came to my group and made a promise when asked the question about the continuation of this role. He was asked, would, would he see a role for a chief scientist to offer advice? And he said he would see that. So we took that as an indication that, although Professor Glover may demit office, that the role itself would continue. And that now seems not to be the case. Our concern is that it seems to have been at the prompting, and I will say no more than that, of certain green groups who, were, uh, who disliked her advice uh, on, amongst other things, um, GMO um, issues. Um, now, I have serious concerns. We're often being told, certainly in fisheries and elsewhere, how important the science is to have at the heart of the debate. And I think this sends exactly the wrong message. I think science should be at the heart of the debate, but to dismiss the scientist who provides it, I think, sends a message, which is, we don't need that. And I think that's the wrong thing. President Juncker has been asked again just to clarify his position. He seems to be a little bit more equivocal now than he was at the beginning, where it seemed to be very clear this would end. I hope he will think again. I think he should think again. I would like to think the legacy of Professor Glover is a continuation of this role, because I think it is a valuable role to bring science again closer to the decision-making process. Thank you. Um, yes, well, if I could move to fisheries, which I know both yourself and Ian Hutchin are, are experts are on. Um, you, you talk about, first of all, the discard ban. I'm, I'm very aware of the, the, the pelagic fishermen who, if this is going to hit first, um, or it's going to come, come into being on the 1st of January 2015, for them, um, are very concerned about the compliance rules and that there's a level playing field for Scottish fleet and uh, fleets uh, from non-EU countries who, who are fishing in the same waters for pelagic species. Uh, would you like to comment on that? Because there is a feeling that uh, there's going to be some unfairness, you know, certainly from our Scottish fleet. Yeah, I've certainly had that um, fear uh, put to me in no uncertain terms, uh, not least when I was in uh, Shetland in the run-up to the European elections. But, uh, uh, I mean, the, 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 the formulation of the regulation, as I understand it, for the pelagic um, fishery, according to the UK government anyway, um, they have expressed themselves satisfied that it was put together on a regional basis, i.e. with input from the... Uh, the relevant uh, member states. Now, whether there's been enough consultation within uh, the member states, I, that's a matter that I don't have uh, absolute clarity on. But my understanding is that there can be and there will be no discrimination or uh, you know, there will be no, in no inequality in enforcement issues when uh, fishers are fishing uh, for the same stock in the same waters. And that's, and that's as it should be. Yeah, I understand that some boats they will have to will have cameras, and others will not. Um, and I think that's that's what, what um, the concerns are. Can I just over. come back in to, to pick up some of the things. Ian and I are both on exactly the same page here. We need to have a regionalised policy for management of fisheries. We've got to make sure that all those who are participating in prosecuting the fishery, no matter where they come from, are bound by the same standards. If they are not, then we will be at an economic disadvantage, and it's tough enough to be a fisherman these days without having an added burden of competing against others with a hand tied behind your back. I think right now the Commission continue to talk about the importance of regionalisation. I've yet to see them demonstrate a commitment to it in any meaningful way, and I think that is something that I'm sure Ian and I will both be pushing for, and indeed I'm sure David Coburn too will be pushing for, because we've got to make sure the Commission here, uh, the fishermen of Scotland, and respond to that on that point. Um, you talk about the re regionalisation and, and the, the wish to have subsidiarity, uh, and yet there, there appears to be a complete ban. They want to have a complete ban on drift nets, um, when in fact some, there are three, I think there are, within the UK there are three drift net fisheries which are considered to be completely sustainable. Um, is, is that not an example of a broad brush and something that hasn't been really clearly thought through. Can I answer that? Yes, I think I agree with you Yes, absolutely. It, uh, it's a, uh, it is a broad brush, but that is a Commission proposal, that there be uh, a, a complete ban on all drift net um, 
fisheries. Now, that is to get through uh, both Council and Parliament, and certainly from the two exchanges of views that we've had in the Fisheries Committee here on that subject, it looks extremely unlikely to me uh, that the Commission will be supported by the Parliament uh, on, that, uh, uh, on that blanket ban because of regionalisation. And I think, you know, we hear people uh, here talking about you know, the importance of key features of CFP reform, um, discard ban being one of them in, in many folks' uh, minds. But in my mind, one of the most important things about the CFP uh, so-called reform was at least the limited extent to which regionalisation or decentralisation uh, is made um, an option. And this is clearly, the drift net ban, clearly uh, one of those which ought to be uh, tackled uh, on the basis of a fishery-by-fishery fishery, uh, approach uh, on a regional basis, because there are some areas where um, drift netting is being carried out on a relatively small scale, relatively inshore and relatively uh, harmlessly in environmental terms. And why should they be penalised uh, by a blanket regulation which goes against the, 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 the principle of, uh, of regionalisation in the new CFP, in my view? If I could just finish off on it, I, I'm, I'm struck right now <clears throat> by this proposal. It fails on two counts, regionalization, as Ian says. It also fails on the science. You can't have a fishery accorded the highest standard by the Marine Stewardship Council of sustainable fishing and then say it must be halted. That is nonsense on stilts. And that brings the Commission into disrepute. And I've recommended, I know Ian has as well, that we send it back. There is a need for a, disc there is a, need for a, a ban on certain types of uh, drift netting, but they're primarily in the Mediterranean, not in the United Kingdom. And the idea of a one net fits all policy is wrong. And I had thought the Commission the last time had agreed they would move away from that. And this, of course, is a legacy from that, that, that last uh, period. Uh, perhaps as we go forward, this sort of approach will simply stop, because frankly, it should. Okay. Mr. Coburn, do you want to come in on that point? Yep. Just simply to agree with my colleagues, and obviously I'll be fighting with them on the same side. Uh, we all agree on this. Um, I think it's, is, you know, it's disgraceful. But then again, uh, if we leave the European Union, we get a 200-mile limit back, which I think would be preferable for all. But I think decisions about fishing should be made in this country. But since we're still in the European Union, we must all fight together to make sure we, Scottish fishermen get the best deal they can. Thank you. Mr McGregor, have you still got some questions? I have got some other questions, if I may continue, or, or do you want me to, to allow others Are in? Are you on now? a different theme? One particular one, the small one. Right, go for it then. Um, just to, to ask uh, Mr Coburn, I, I, the, you, I absolutely agree with you uh, about um, the dangers to uh, the financial service sectors in um, London and Edinburgh, which are obviously very, very important with the invisible earnings and everything else that comes with them. And um, you say you will work to ensure these do not disappear to Frankfurt. <laughs> How do you intend to do that? <laughs> well, that is a very good point. <laughs> um, and uh, quite frankly, the best way of doing that is to leave the European Union. Um, I hate to harp on the same theme, but there you are. Um, but, but while you're still in it, so, uh, well, MP I think the best way is simply to point out the inconsistencies, point out what the Commission are up to, point out what the European Union in general is trying to do, and the, the more we highlight it and shine a uh, light under their rock um, and bring it to the attention of the British government, because I'm afraid Mr Cameron and uh, his merry men uh, don't seem to be as vexed about it as we are. And uh, this is not just a matter of, of, of the, the invisible earnings. It's also a great deal of employment in Edinburgh that rests on this. Um, and the last thing we, we want is, is to, to lose more jobs in Scotland. I think we need jobs in Scotland more than anything else. And, um, you know, that would be a, a t tremendously bad step. We must defend our position. We do not want everything going to Frankfurt. And they want everything euro-denominated. So, again, this is another major problem and another major reason why we must leave the European Union. Uh, jobs will not only disappear from here to, Brussels, to Frankfurt, but they will also disappear off to the Far East, where there are less regulations. I'm, could I come back later on? Yeah, OK. Uh, Catherine, I know you've been working uh, in some detail on this specific issue. I wonder if you wanted to contribute at this point. <clears throat> Thank you, Madam Convener. I have a completely uh, different perspective from Mr. 
Coburn, um, on financial services, uh, the rules that we make, which apply across the European Union, you need to have a strong voice uh, in there to make your case. Uh, I don't see uh, David coming along to the Econ uh, Committee to make that case for Scottish financial services where 100,000 people are employed. However, um, on that point, um, I believe that uh, we have to ensure that we make sure that our financial services regulation has a Scottish voice within that. And I work very closely with the Scottish Financial Enterprise and others. Uh, but I think that uh, it would be a disaster for Scotland and the rest of the UK if we were to go down the route that Mr Coburn is proposing, in particular for financial services. So I suggest maybe he speaks to financial services institutions and talks to them more in depthly about the consequences of the things that he proposes. Uh, may I point out that I, I worked in the city for many years, Sorry, so Mr. I think Coburn. I know more about it. Than if we can speak through the chair, please, oh, that would I'm keep sure. keep the. Uh, may I point out that I worked for many years in the city of London, so I think I know an awful lot more about it than Catherine. With respect. Okay. Surprising. <laughs> well, well, <laughs> on. Sorry, sorry. Moving on, Mr. Coffey. Mr. Coffey, you have a, a different line of questioning. Uh, thanks very much, convener, and good morning, colleagues. Uh, it's nice to, to see you. Um, according to the European Commission, 90% uh, of jobs in Europe by 2020 will require some form of digital skills. Um, and I was particularly pleased to see, as one of Mr Juncker's priorities, the connected digital single market being amongst the 10 priorities there. And I would be grateful to hear your views on that too. Um, there are two aspects that are of specific interest to me in this area. One is on the whole digital connectivity, infrastructure, broadband issue, and how we're making progress to make that more com competitive. And secondly, on the digital skills agenda, we are only in the past few weeks, a European Commission report has highlighted that digital competencies amongst particularly the youngsters uh, needs to be improved. So I would just like to ask you for your views on this, whether you support the, the aims and objectives of the digital single market, whether it makes a contribution to jobs, growth and competitiveness, and what do you think we can do to improve the skills and competencies amongst our youngsters, particularly in this digital age that we live in? Yes, go Catherine Styler. Thank you, Madam Convener. I think you're absolutely uh, right in your approach, and I think that uh, it was really good to take part in the coding dojo that was uh, about three or four, well, now about four weeks ago, where uh, young people came to the Parliament to actually show us how to code. And I think this kind of action, maybe you could do something in the Scot, or maybe you've already done so, but it was a really good event. And uh, where a, 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 a boy from Ireland who was 12 was showing me. What, how to do programming and when I talked to my eight-year-old son about these kind of things it was interesting the same program we've been working on was the one he'd suggested but I think skills are absolutely uh, paramount the digital single market of course is this you know what what it is the real economy isn't it and the thing about when you look at um and I'll just quote you one of the, the statistics that although 47% of EU consumers have purchased online from a seller based in their home country, only 15% have purchased from another EU country. So there are issues about trust. There's issues about um, <clears throat> making sure, and I suppose that's some mindset issues as well, but also about inclusiveness too. I think the key issues in IMCO are concluding the negotiations on the European data protection rules. I think it's adding more ambition to the ongoing reform of the EU telecoms rules. It's about modernising copyright rules as well in light of the digital revolution and also modernising and simplifying consumer rules for online and digital purchases. I think that uh, those are some of the key challenges that, that we face. But um, I think that with, uh, I mean, Neely Cruz has just finished being the digital commissioner makes a little joke of the fact they've had taken two men to replace the work of one woman. But in saying that, I think that uh, that combination of uh, Commissioner Ansip and Commissioner um, Uttinger, I think they will do a tremendous job to ensure that we get this right over the next five years because it's so pivotal to our economy. Thank you. Um, is there any other update, Mr Coburn? Yeah, well, um, my, my own business is, is based, the shipping business is based entirely on the internet, um, so I'm very aware of, of, of this problem. 
and um, I, you know, I, I believe that we must have a better education system. Um, I regret the fact we do not have final grammar schools like Alan Glens in Scotland anymore. Um, I think we need to get to grips with making sure we have uh, good schools that are teaching good technology. It's extremely important. It is the future. Uh, it's, it's, they're doing it in the Far East. If we don't do it here, we will be left behind. The future is the internet. And the other big problem, as Catherine said, and something I feel personally is a major problem for my business, is payments and cross-border and cross border fraud. This is a major problem and something the European Union can actually help with a little bit, but um, it is something that uh, is extremely important and something we must get to grips with. OK, thank you very much. Is, is any of our, our Brussels contingent want to add anything to that? If, if I may, just, just, very, yeah. uh, just very briefly. Um, I mentioned at the start that the Commission are likely to announce a 300 billion investment package, so one half of what Mr Coffey was asking for uh, in terms of structural investment is likely to come out of that if, if we get that programme right. So there's a, a chance we can roll out more broadband connectivity as a result of that investment package. Slightly different from uh, what was asked, but uh, the TTIP that I mentioned earlier, one of the key aims of that is to improve uh, telecommunications and digital uh, connections between the US and the EU and people have mentioned the problem of buying consumer goods inside Europe, that's even more difficult trying to do it transatlantic. If you've ever, for example, just to take a slightly frivolous example, but if you log on to the US iTunes instead of the UK iTunes, there's songs you can't buy in the US but you can buy here. Uh, if we get the TTIP right, that will cease and it will be like one single market. So that will uh, both improve opportunities for consumers in the European Union, but also for uh, rural businesses and so on that will be able to access digitally into the US market, ship into the US market in a much more simple basis than they can at the present time. Okay, thank you very much. Mr Coffey, are you... Yeah, I think, thank you very much for the, the contributions there. there. It's just, just to find you clarify maybe with Mr Coburn, I mean, despite the obviously political views that you have and differences that we may express, do you, do you still support the concept of a digital single market in Europe as being one that encourages growth and competitiveness? I, I think we, we need to have a, sing, have a single market in, in, uh, in, uh, in, that, in that area, of course. This is something we all need to cooperate on, but it doesn't need to be done through the European Union. I mean, you know, we, uh, the European Union is, is just using our money to, 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 uh, to do something we could be doing ourselves. Uh, I think there's a, the, European, the way the European Union does it is extremely complicated and unnecessarily so. I'm sure it could be better negotiated by all the nations in Europe without having to go through the European Union. But since we're here, we might as well bake the best of what we've got. OK, Claire Adamson. Hey, uh, thank you very much, Convener. Good morning, everyone. Um, it's just following on in the, on, on the theme and something that we've touched on a little bit this morning. Um, and I, I know that um, Mr Martin and, and Ms Styler have both mentioned the, um, the youth guarantee as being of particular interest. Given that economic growth is so key, um, the other area of concern that I have is women's gender segregation in the workplace. And given we've just been talking about the digital economy, that also applies to other STEM areas. And I was wondering, um, I had a little bit of a tease at the ambassador, the Italian ambassador who was here about the priorities for their presidency, in that it was somewhat a little disappointing, the gender makeup of the new commission. Um, so um, I just wondered in... How, how, in your areas in the coming years, you'll be able to, to look at these areas for women in the workplace? Yeah, well, Mr Coburn. Uh, you can believe all men and all women are equal. Uh, we don't believe in special pleading. Uh, in our party, you get on by merit. As a matter of fact, we've got more women than we have got men standing in senior positions, which is, is pretty good. And that's not by... by, by special pleadings, special segregation, or anything of that sort. I think everyone should have an equal shot at the, shot at the, the, the cup. Um, obviously, I deplore any sort of discrimination, but um, you know, I don't, I, I'm not a mad, I, mean, I may be a feminist in as much as I want women to, to get on in the world, uh, but I don't think we should, we should have discrimination. Okay, Catherine. Yeah, thank you for that, that question. I think that, um, Many of us actually 
pushed the commission much harder. At the beginning, we thought there might only be three female commissioners, which was completely unacceptable. So the, the number that we now have, um, although I would like to have parity, was an achievement in many of us lobbying and pushing for that. Um, and I think that has to be recognised with the work of, of MEPs <clears throat> to put that on the agenda. But I think that the fact that we have um, a, a Spanish colleague from my political group who's chair of the Women's Rights Committee, the fact that gender mainstreaming is about making sure that all policies are about inclusivity as well. And I think that gender is such an important issue when it comes to uh, debates that we have about gender representation on boards, whether it's about the issues and ongoing about maternity, lots and lots of issues that we deal with at a European level. And I think that, um, that, that the fact that in the Parliament now, I think that, uh, that you know, the fact that uh, when my my baby was 11 weeks old, I could take my my um, son to go in and vote, and it was seen as something positive, um, because as you know, we don't we are not replaced when we vote as MEPs, um, and that's something that I think is uh, really needs to be changed. But I think that in the Parliament, uh, there's great recognition of those issues, but we still have a fight on our hands, and the Commission, uh, the fact that it took us to push the Commission and Mr. Mr. Juncker, to put that as an, an issue is something that we have to address again in five years' time to make sure that doesn't happen. Thank you. Would um, our men in Brussels, Ian Duncan, thank you. <coughs> Sorry, we are not, not all men in Brussels. Um, two, two things I'd note there. The first is that I think um, here in Brussels, we often forget that, that the European Union has quite a wide cultural base, and there are a number of challenges, we're not all at the same place. <coughs> It's trying to make sure that what happens in the European Union can serve as a beacon for others, not just in terms of, of, of the gender mix, but also in terms of other areas of prejudice, whether it cover age discrimination or ethnicity or, or, or sexuality, whatever it happens to be. And I think there is a role here, and I think that that, that message can be sent from, from Brussels in a way that perhaps it can be heard in a very different way in other parts of the European Union. The second thing I would note, and it was quite an interesting point made by uh, President Juncker when he was uh, seeking to solicit from the member states their nominees for his commission, was he did make the statement, um, if you nominate a woman or if you put a woman forward, I can guarantee she will get a more senior position. And I thought that was an interesting um, offer, not one taken up, oddly enough, by many of the member states who then subsequently nominated, but it was an interesting declaration at the outset. So it, it will be interesting to see again as we move forward. Um, how well we do begin to move toward broader parity in so many of these areas, uh, whether it be uh, driven here in, in the European Union or indeed elsewhere. Thank you, Mr. Duncan. Um, I, I, I think completed. A, a final comment that um, one of the things to really regret about Anne Glover um, and the removal of her post is, is that she was such a great role model for um, women across Europe. So. In, in Indeed. Before I go to Alec Crowley, I'm just very conscious of the time and I wonder if, if our MEPs have got maybe an extra few minutes they can add on, um, if, they, if they don't mind. Oh, excellent, excellent. Alec Crowley. Um, could, I, could I pick up on this, this question of TTIP? And, I, mean, I think, David, you will, you will know that there is widespread concern amongst trade unions within the UK, within Scotland. Um, and many others, and the Parliament, this committee is going to be doing quite a bit of work over, over the next month or two, taking evidence sessions on TTIP. But you know, it comes back to a couple of points. The argument in terms of health and the argument that was made at the referendum was that if Scotland was an independent state, then, then it would be treated as such. The fact that it was a no vote means that it's part of the UK and the UK state. And therefore, if health services are privatised in England but are not privatised in Scotland, that we could have a situation where these large corporations could actually be, um, and, and, and certainly the suggestion of this agreement, that they could basically sue um, the UK or sue the Scottish Government if we were not putting our health services that are privatised in England out in Scotland. Now, the Health Secretary, as I understand it, is taking legal advice on that, and in the coming weeks, we would, we would hope to be able to get that. But that, that is one of the major concerns. The Italian bas ambassador gave evidence to this committee a number of weeks ago and, and was quite specific in that if services are in the public sector, then they would not be part of the agreement. But that's the issue around health. But the very idea that you could have 
you know, large American corporations um, basically suing, whether it be the Scottish government or the UK government, to try and get contracts and work, just does not seem to be something that would be acceptable. And back to the point, I think, that Ian Hudson made, is that we do certainly need to have some kind of transparency around this, because regardless of whether it's it's legitimate concerns or whether it's a feeding frenzy. The fact is that there is a growing concern, I think, right across not just Scotland but across the UK, of, of the implications of TTIP. Mr Martin, I'm going to uh, let you come back on that and then I'll let you come in, Mr Coburn. Ms Mr Martin, I think uh, one of the real concerns that, that has been lobbied to all of us, and that's the reason why we're taking forward the, the committee, is the investor dispute mechanism. And I, I remembered from my notes that you had said earlier that that was something that was a concern. So maybe in answering Alec Rowley's question, you could maybe answer that one as well. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Let me just say this. Morning, Alec. Uh, let me just say at the outset that um, my group, I, I just want to speak for my group on this, uh, and I'm the socialist group coordinator, so I lead for the whole of the socialist group on trade policy. Uh, we take the view that a good TTIP will be good for jobs and growth in the US. We're sceptical about some of the, the figures that the Commission bring out about the percentage of growth that would create or the specific number of jobs, because we really just don't believe you can do economic modelling uh, to that extent. But we do believe the direction of travel with a good TTIP would be towards creating more jobs and, and stimulating growth. That said, we've said we have three red lines, and Alex, in a sense, touched on at least two of the three. Firstly, we will not support any TTIP that damages public services. Secondly, we do not believe that TTIP should have investor state dispute in it. And thirdly, Alec didn't mention this, but equally important, uh, we don't believe it should lower consumer standards. You've probably heard about the debate that this might let chlorinated chicken or GMOs or whatever else into the European Union. And if I could just deal with them each very briefly, I'll try and be as brief as I can. But on, on public services, Firstly, it should be made very clear that unless a service is privatised voluntarily, and that's the emphasis on voluntarily, it doesn't even come in the, the remit of trade agreements. So you cannot force privatisation. The argument between Scotland and England at the present time is that where England has already privatised part of its health service, if, and I don't accept this argument, but the argument is, is if TTIP was in existence, they couldn't then take them back under public control. So it's not that you would not be able to, you would have to be forced to privatise if it's not already in the public, if it's not already in the private sector, but it's what's called the ratchet clause, that you couldn't then bring it back under public control. That is not my interpretation of it. My interpretation is that if you open up a service, then it's open to competition. You open it up and you don't exclude it from a trade agreement, then you open it up not just to competition within your domestic market, but to whoever you've signed your trade deal with, in this case, America. Um, but the other thing to emphasise is, so far, the EU has never signed a free trade agreement that doesn't exempt public services and specifically does not exempt health. And the UK, because the member states also have an opt-out, the UK has never signed, it never not exercised its right for an opt-out on health services when the EU has signed a free trade agreement. So the likelihood of public services being included are slim. But the bigger problem is the one you alluded to and the one that Alec alluded to, which is investor state dispute, which has been abused uh, in the past. This is not a new thing. Firstly, there are something like 1,400 uh, ISDSs around at the moment. Uh, many of them, and we believe illegally, uh, since the Lisbon Treaty came into force, many of them internal uh, EU agreements. And one of the famous cases, of course, it's often cited as an argument against ISDS, is the fact that Swedish companies are suing the German government because of the Germany ending its nuclear programme. And they are saying that they should be entitled to uh, significant compensation because Germany has denied them the right to make money in Germany by ending the, the nuclear programme. Um, and there have been other cases, the famous cases, the Philip Morris case against uh, Australia on plain packaging for cigarettes. We don't believe it's right that companies should be able to sue for changes in public policy. Uh, we don't believe it's right that they should be able to sue uh, for future profits that they think they are losing if, a, if it's a policy change. What is right, though, and this is where we have to find a balance, is if assets are expropriated, companies need to be protected. And 
you, know, you might think in the modern world that doesn't happen very often, but just think back uh, less than a year to Argenti Argentina uh, taking over Spanish uh, assets in uh, Argentina and not necessarily until investor state dispute was exercised, paying any compensation for that. So we try to find a way where you can guarantee protection for physical assets, but not for the other uh, things that investor state dispute has been used for. And a further complication, I'm sorry this is a bit more complicated than you might have expected, but the further complication is that if you take America, for example, nine of the 27, 28 EU member states have investor state dispute with the US. And frankly, they're all very badly worded at the moment, all loosely worded, which doesn't open them up for attack uh, compared to the deal that the EU is likely to do, which would be much tighter. How can I say that? Because we've done a deal with Canada, and if you look at the investor state dispute we've signed with Canada, it's much more restricted in terms of what can uh, be sued for. All of that said, let me repeat though, we do not believe investor state disputes should be in agreements. We think there's, a, there's another mechanism for, for dealing with this issue, which is state-to-state -state, uh, settlement, uh, not allowing individual private companies to uh, sue. But the point to emphasize is, firstly, it's not new. It's been going on for a long time. Uh, and secondly, uh, that the EU's model, and I, I, some people might say, well, I would say that, but I actually believe this, the EU model is better than any model that any of the existing member states have at the present time. It's because we've learned from history, we've learned from mistakes that have been made with the existing investor state dispute. On transparency, finally, uh, the point that Alec is, um, was making, uh, he's absolutely right. This started off, it was very difficult initially to get good information. That has changed quite dramatically. We now have the negotiating mandate. We now know what the Commission is negotiating on. After every round of negotiations uh, from the very beginning, the Commission has been coming and reporting to the members of the Trade Committee, which has been good for us, but rather frustrating because it's been done behind closed doors, in confidence, and we're not meant to go out and talk about the specifics that we've been, we're being told. And as Ian rightly said at the beginning, there's now an agreement that this is going to be open to all members of Parliament and the documentation is going to be open to all members of Parliament. So we're, we, we, I don't think we're there yet, but we're moving in the right direction in transparency. But Alex right to say this is an important issue. Uh, we believe, and I think collectively we believe, that when we get to the end of this process, uh, we should have an informed public. They should know what's at stake in terms of TTIP, whether, uh, you know, understand the content of it. Uh, so that we can have an informed discussion. And then the European Parliament, point to emphasise, the European Parliament will have a vote on this. This is not something the Commission can settle or the Member States can settle on their own. At the end of the day, the European Parliament will have a democratic vote to decide whether to accept or reject TTIP. OK, uh, thank you very, very much. I've got quick... Mr Duncan, I'll come back to you, but Mr Coburn had, had got in first and then I'll come back. And I think Jamie's got a brief supplementary right, comment uh, to you. Mr Coburn. To answer Mr Rowley's question, uh, you know, I, I, I agree with you. Um, we, we can't, I, you know, the last thing we want is TTIP to be inv getting involved in public services and damaging the health service. We don't want that to be the case. Uh, absolutely not. Uh, we believe that the, the health service should be protected against that. Again, this is the problem you have if you allow the European Union, which is, you know making decisions about this for the whole of Europe. Um, I would much prefer to this decision to be made in the UK by, by Westminster. I don't think it should be, should, be, uh, should be made in the European Union. I don't think they should, people should be allowed to sue. And I think we should, you know, if a decision is made in Scotland, then it should be respected that the Scottish Parliament makes a decision and it, it, it has responsibility for, for health, then that decision should stand. Um, but, you know, as far as I'm concerned, we should not allow TTIP to, to you know, attack our public services. UKIP believe very strongly in the health service, uh, we, and, you know, we will do everything we can to protect it. OK, if I go to Dr Duncan and then to Ian Hudgston, if you want to come in behind Dr Duncan, Ian. Uh, <clears throat> thank you very much, Madam Convener. Uh, like my colleagues, I've had a lot of mail on this, and I, of course, was very concerned. Um, a free trade agreement should be, at its heart, a way of generating growth and generating jobs. But it, it has now come down to very focused concerns, mostly around, again, the health service and its investor state dispute mechanism. I sat with the chief negotiator about this so I could fully understand it. And what became clear in the discussions was that the clauses which exist in the current trade agreements, uh, and have, which have been signed in the past, are remarkably loose and poor. And yet, when you look at what has been achieved in the proposal, and I say again, it's a proposal, it is substantially different. And it, 
begs the question whether a number of the more prominent cases which have been regularly cited would indeed have been possible under the new revised clause proposed in the investor state dispute mechanism. Now, I look upon the, the issue of the, the healthcare service as well in a broader sense, not just in terms of the privatisation, which I don't fully accept the comments made there, but I also recognise that this area can have extraordinary benefits in terms of the support for medical devices, which can reduce the costs, and these devices themselves are significant and important to our health service, as well as that we look at some of the issues around pharmaceuticals and other costs there, and in terms of research and sharing. So there are benefits which we can see and which, we will, which will materially help the National Health Service as well. So we need to be very careful when we're discussing this that we are not seeking to prejudice. And the most important thing, again, when we talk about the transparency issue, we have to remember this is the first time we've ever really had transparency in any of these uh, uh, proposed negotiations and previous uh, free trade agreements, there simply wasn't any transparency. So we've made a huge leap forward. The important thing, again, is we are in the process just now of negotiating uh, the language and the material. And importantly, if we are not satisfied, then we will not sign it off as a parliament. If we are satisfied, we will make sure that we are able to explain why we are satisfied. But that's the important, that is the important thing. This is not a done deal. It's not a secret deal. It will not happen in a closed room. It will happen here in the chamber well, actually, it will happen in Strasbourg, technically, in the Chamber of the European Parliament, and we will have an opportunity then uh, to make sure that we are uh, exercising the will of the Scottish people. Mr Hudgeton. Uh, just briefly, I, I think it's good that there seems to be a broad level of uh, agreement so far amongst the members from Scotland on this, because there are a whole host of issues that are very important to us. Just a, a, a quick uh, reference to I mean, why should the EU be negotiating trade deals. Uh, I think it's true to say that even the UK government, which uh, likes to tell us that it's very big and powerful, accepts that the EU has more negotiating power uh, in uh, the trade aspects, the genuinely beneficial trade uh, aspects of this kind of agreement than the UK itself uh, would have. And that's why the UK government is um, supporting the process. It's a bit, uh, to my mind, a little bit too kind of um, uh, careless if that's the word about whether or not public services might be affected but I think the most important thing uh, arising from your recent deliberations is the fact that you're to have an inquiry from Scotland's point of view and I think that the, the, the issue about Scotland, England and different, um, different kind of priorities in health services is one that really needs to be looked at and your inquiry can draw that out hopefully and help us too to uh, ensure that we uh, do what we can to help get it right at the end of the day. Excellent, thank you. Very quickly, Mr Coburn, then James. Uh, one of the problems, of course, with all this is Ian was saying it goes to the Parliament, we're going to say no. Um, the problem is basically the Parliament's a Parliament of eunuchs because there's very little power we actually have. There's an inbuilt majority that support the Commission and it's very difficult to, to change that. So, you know, it's not, it's not all um, as simple as, as that. You get a quick supplementary? Yeah. Well, uh, it's just that the, uh, on TTIP, the, the US has been very clear, I think, that public sector services is never part of the trade agreements. And I think the greatest gains for the UK and Scotland, particularly, would be oil and gas and financial services. But also the, fa the, the farmers' eyes are lighting up because, for example, the Scots beef import ban might be lifted, I'm told, which would be very important for Scottish farmers. Uh, would you like to comment on some of the benefits of TTIP that could accrue to Scotland uh, from, uh, from a, a sensible, good agreement? Mr Martin, do you want to come back on that and then come in with a question or, or comment that you've got? Uh, yeah, in terms of the benefits, the benefits are, are potentially enormous. I mean, firstly, uh, David Coburn was making a big play about financial services. Well, it's very difficult for our banks and insurance companies to operate in the, European, in the US market at the present time. And one of our offensive interests in the EU is to open up the US financial services to competition from British and European companies. And uh, I don't think we're being parochial to think that Scottish companies could do particularly well in that market if it was an open and free and fair market. It's obviously good news for Scottish food and uh, drinks products, as uh, Jamie has said, particularly uh, beef, but not just beef. There's some specialised fishing uh, you know, prawns and so on that I find it quite difficult for sanitary and cytosanitary reasons to get access to the US market that we'd hopefully deal with in such a trade agreement. There are uh, go to the borders and you'll find that the, some of the, the textiles companies 
have serious concerns about, although the level of tariffs on textiles is on average very low, there are some significant tariff spikes which stop us selling some cashmere and other uh, niche products into the, the US market. And I could go on. I mean, even very simple things like uh, Livingston-based electronics companies who make small components find it part to be part, difficult to be part of supply chains because of uh, technical barriers to trade and so on. If we deal with all of this, it can be very good news in terms of connecting us to the, uh, the US market. And uh, maybe I'll just leave it at that. Thanks. OK, thank you very much. I'm very conscious of time now. Mr Rowley, do you want to come back on any of that? No, I think, I mean, I think the, the, the key point I would make is that there is genuine concern. You say that yourself for the meal bags uh, that you have. And I think it's important that our European members of Parliament, I mean, it maybe comes to my final point, because a number uh, the, the you have in your written submission talked about the rise of uh, Eurosceptic parties across Europe, the rise of the right across Europe. Um, if we're going to address that, then this, this idea of openness, transparency, and if this is a major concern as it's coming across, then I think as MEPs it would be good to know what, what you're going to do to be much more proactive in pointing out the benefits and addressing the concerns. Any reaction to that? Dr. Duncan, sorry. Oh. Um, UKIP, of course, are not a right-wing party. We're a libertarian party. Um, in many ways, we agree with a lot of things the Labour Party say. So um, uh, we're, well, I think we're more libertarian than any other party in as much as uh, we don't want to tell people what to do, whereas Liberal Democrats are extremely keen to tell you what to eat for breakfast, not smoking, not drinking, basically not having much fun at all. So we're, we're a much more freedom-based party. We want this little... Uh, interference in people's lives. But obviously, um, if the law of the European Union continues to interfere in people's lives without dem a democratic mandate, then quite frankly, you're going to see the rise of the right in Europe, uh, like Madame Le Pen and various other people. Um, Dr. Duncan and then Ian Hudgeton. David would like to come in before me, so I'm quite happy to see. Oh, Sorry, right, okay. I, I, I wasn't oh, going right, okay. to. I, I was trying not to respond to David Coburn's earlier remark, but he's re repeated it. This idea that the European Parliament simply rubber stamps what the Commission does is just absolute nonsense. I mean, one of the biggest trade deals in the previous Parliament was ACTA, the Anti-Counterfeiting uh, Treaty, uh, and the European Parliament rejected it with the largest majority it's ever rejected a Commission proposal. So the idea that the Commission will go out and negotiate, bring forward a treaty, and the Parliament will say, whatever the content of that treaty, we accept it, is just not true. And we're going to have very tight and interesting debates when Singapore and Canada uh, come before the European Parliament. It's not going to be automatic, it's not going to be rubber stamp. And TTIP, because of the attention that's been paid to TTIP, is going to be highly controversial if it comes to this European Parliament. I actually think the timescale in terms of negotiations and, rather, and the legal scrubbing and all the rest of it will probably be the next European Parliament that deals with TTIP. But because of the public attention on TTIP, the idea that MEPs are just going to say yes, uh, regardless of the content, is an absolute nonsense. And David should... Uh, if he wants to be a serious member of the European Parliament, he should actually concentrate on the issues and actually make up his mind on the base of the issues, not on simple prejudice. Dr Duncan. Yes, well, I'll just come back to a bit more of a prosaic approach then. I, I have tried to be as active as I can. So what I've done is I've written to the... the I've sat with the chief negotiator, uh, written to them. We've had responses back from the, the Director General for Trade. Uh, I have put that onto my website... Uh, I've also put alongside that a number of the, the questions which are frequently asked with the answers alongside that. We've had some correspondence with Len McCluskey, who's had a number of concerns. I've written to him directly with information, and I've said to him in a very open manner, you know, please now come back to me with any other questions you might have. Please frame those, and I will pursue those as well. I'm wanting to make sure that I can ground out any concerns that anybody has. And I will always put that onto my website so that I can be as open and transparent as I possibly can be. If anyone has any questions, they can tweet me, they can mail me, they can write to me, and I will put all that information out there so that people can come back and query. So there should be no suggestion that uh, we're not very active and very engaged and telling people what we're up to. Mr Hodgson. Uh, David Martin really said what I was going to say. I mean, it is completely and utterly untrue to suggest that the European Parliament has no power. In fact, the absolute contrary uh, is the case on the vast majority of the legislative work that we do. Mr Coburn. Well, um, the various trade ministers of Europe could, could get together and agree a US trade deal 
and cut out the middleman, the EU, with all the flannel, money, expense, and all the rest of it, and confusion. It could all be probably done a lot faster and a, a lot more efficiently. Uh, but that being beside the point, a lot of things are agreed in Europe and um, are, are not exactly uh, done by democratic means. And we all know that, and, uh, and the people have spoken many times about this and did so in the general election by putting UKIP first. Catherine. The, the concerns uh, Alec has been sharing, and we share those too about uh, making sure the constituents that are writing to us, and we have had thousands of uh, expressions of interest in this, as I'm sure you all have as well. And maybe if, um, you know, as Ian does, we've got standard letters where, you know, all our committees seem to be having TTIP hearings where the negotiators actually come. It's all web streamed as well. It's, you know, the, the things that we are trying to do to put people's concerns, and David is doing a fantastic job as the coordinator in the socialist group to put those concerns forward, and the trade committee itself is doing doing, um, I, I think, uh, an excellent job of holding uh, people to care. Each committee actually has a standing rapporteur on TTIP. So you would have had a standing, if it, you were in the European Parliament, you would have had a standing rapporteur of your members. That has never happened before. There are issues that have to be um, addressed clearly. And of course, um, this is a negotiation. Nothing is done, no deal is done until it's uh, final. So um, I think that uh, we have to keep this dialogue on TTIP going. And we have to ensure that you've given the information uh, as well. Thank you. Yeah, I think in preparation for our inquiry, our clerks are looking very, very closely at the lead that's been taken by all of our, our members in, in, in Europe. Um, our final question from Rod Campbell this morning. Are, are you still OK for time um, as far as where you need to be next? It can make it very, very quickly, very quickly, Rod Campbell. Uh, thank you, convener, uh, and uh, can I also thank Mr. Rowley for raising those questions on TTIP, which were very interesting. I welcome the comments made on transparency in particular. Um, could I just move to one of Mr. Juncker's 10 policy pri priorities, uh, which is uh, really to be towards a new policy on migration? I wonder if interested to, to hear the comments of the representatives here on that. Catherine? Well, he's not put anything forward yet, so I can't obviously right, okay. comment on that uh, issue. But I think once the Commission's work, work programme is there, then that's an opportunity to have a debate and a discussion on that. Okay, Mr. Coburn, have you anything to add on that one? Yes, well, um, obviously, uh, UKIP believes that um, unlimited migration is an enormous problem for the UK in general and, U and Scotland in particular. Um, if, if we have unlimited migration, we are unable to decide what's going to happen about our health service, provide for it. We're not able to work out uh, what we'll need in terms of schools or buildings or, or just about anything else for that matter. And it is not in the interest of the UK uh, to do that. What it does is depress wages for, for the working man and woman, um, and that is not a good thing. And if you ask them, they'll see that the more progressively they're voting for UKIP because they're worried about their position and their, their families. Uh, I think that whatever the European Union do on migration, uh, they, unless all 28 countries agree to it, nothing will happen. And quite frankly, we cannot afford the system, what we've got going on at the moment. Um, this has to stop. And UKIP are in favour of an Australian-style system whereby we... We, you know, we choose the people we want to come to this country. We just have an open-door immigration policy, which has created a great deal of trouble throughout the UK. Okay, thank you. Um, Ian Hodgson. Um, just briefly, and like Catherine, until we see a specific proposal, we, you know, it's difficult to say exactly how we might react. But I can reasonably, <coughs> confidently predict that there will be no proposal to depart from the basic uh, right of free movement uh, of citizens in the European Union, and that's one of the things that is highly advantageous uh, to uh, Scotland and indeed the rest of the UK, I would say. When, I, when we talk about immigration, uh, I don't include that right of free movement, movement because that's not immigration, it's, uh, it's the, one of the, the basic uh, benefits that we have, and uh, you know, it's fair to say that there uh, are estimated to be uh, about as many um, people from parts of the UK uh, now resident in other parts of the European Union than the other way around. So I think that there are, you know, that there are benefits in both directions uh, that will continue. Okay, uh, Mr. Duncan and Mr. Martin, have you got any... Uh, Dr. Duncan. 
uh, just very briefly, I think, might just um, enrich our country. I was brought up in a small village in Perthshire. They now have a Polish island and local co-op. I think they are an extraordinary asset to our country. I'm aware, however, that is not a view shared across the whole land. And I think, again, we need to have a serious debate so that we can make sure that we are talking about migrants in a sensible way, which is as a huge economic asset, as a huge cultural asset, and as a huge social asset. Okay, Mr Martin. Actually, you're going to get unusual consensus. I agree with my two colleagues here, and Catherine's right as well. We don't have any uh, detailed proposals yet, but uh, Ian's absolutely right. This is not about internal EU movement. This is not the EU freedom of movement we're talking about. This is migrants coming from outside uh, the European Union. Uh, and there, uh, I, I want to see Mr Juncker's proposals, because I hope they'll be about ensuring we have a humanitarian system for dealing with migrants who come to, to Europe, because in some parts of Europe, sadly, they are treated very badly. Um, we do better in terms of policing our borders, yes, but we do it in a proper and, and as I say, humane uh, manner, that we do more to help the countries that are the source of the migrants to improve their economy and to try and stem the flow that way by actually making the living standards in the host country uh, better than it currently is. But we don't, we really just don't know what Mr Juncker means by this. I, mean, I haven't got the piece of paper in front of me, but if, if you look at his 10 priorities, um, they are frankly very bland. On TTIP, the one I remember, he says something along the lines of we want a good and balanced TTIP. I mean, that's a meaningless uh, statement. So the priorities are not very, uh, not really in my in mind priorities. They're, they're kind of pious statements at the moment. And what we need is a commission work programme to see how we're going to put flesh on them. Okay. Mr Campbell, do you want to come back on that? Yeah, the specific point I might want to just add on is just uh, what the European Parliament were planning in terms of uh, keeping an eye on the problems of human trafficking uh, in this session. Anybody want to comment on that? Yeah. Just serious very problem. briefly. I hope so. Sorry, sorry, Dr. Duncan. I'm going to hear from David Coburn first. Just very briefly. Uh, just you know, human trafficking is always an appalling business, and we want it stopped. Um, I'm looking into it as much as possible. It's very much a concern of UKIP, as you can imagine and we will be doing whatever we can, which is obviously in the European Union very difficult, because the European Union, uh, you know, as I say, 28 countries have to agree to change the open door immigration policy, and at the end of the day, the only way to stop it is to leave the European Union, and I'm afraid that's the logical conclusion. We cannot do anything to stop it, and there is no effort on the part of the European Union to do anything about the, the, problem that's, the problems this is causing. And that is leading to the rise as the other gentleman was mentioning, of the far right. And that's what you're going to get if you don't stop open door immigration. Dr. Duncan, and we'll finish with Catherine Styler. Dr. Duncan. I, I'm not sure Mr. Coburn's put his finger on that. Um, that being said, I, I'm the vice chair of the South Asia uh, delegation, and I'm putting a paper to that particular body on this very issue. I am concerned, and I believe we should be looking at it in detail. I would like to use that particular uh, delegation to begin a, a debate, and I hope that's a wider debate, and I know that, 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 that Scotland has taken a very active role in this, and I think the European Parliament is playing catch-up. Catherine Styler. Thank you, Madam Convener. I know the work that you've done um, addressing that issue in Scotland and also Jenny Mara, and it's such an important issue. And I think at a European level where cooperation can be had between uh, police forces in a joint way to conduct uh, uh, action, joint action, collecting information is vitally important. That's one of the strengths that we have by cooperating on some of those issues. But anywhere where there's human trafficking and that, uh, d you know, that, that the treatment of, uh, of individuals, and in particular children and women, I think we we have uh, to make sure that we put pressure on the new commission, I think, as you've just outlined, and I think that we have to keep that on. But I think that this might be something where uh, the interest of the Scottish Parliament in, in tackling human trafficking and the work that's being done at a European level really does um, work, work. We can work well together to tackle that horrific problem. Yeah, and we're, we're looking, seriously looking forward to the piece of legislation coming. Could I very briefly, yeah, Dr. Very briefly, because I've literally, I mean, the meeting before coming here was a meeting of the Human Rights Subcommittee, and just to, and again, to counter David Coburn's allegations that nothing ever happens, uh, we were just being presented with a paper, which I have in front of me, which is uh, Foreigners and Human Rights in Morocco for a Radically New Asylum and Migration Policy. It was presented to us by the President of the National Human Rights Council in Morocco, and it's all, it was partly funded by the European Union as a way of helping Morocco deal with these very issues, uh, migration more widely, but human trafficking specifically. 
Okay, uh, thank you very much. I think we're going to have to finish very quickly. Uh, to say that I'm very pleased that my European colleagues um, have, of various different political parties are all coalescing around UKIP's view on immigration, probably something to do with the fact that we we came within 300 votes of capturing a safe Labour seat in the north of England, and we're about to capture a, a Tory seat in the south. Yeah. I, I would like to Catherine. agree with my colleague David Martin on that point. Okay, um, thank you very much for your contribution. I know that we have taken serious advantage of your time this morning. Um, we've, we've taken you half an hour over the time we allotted. We, we very much um, appreciate that um, and going forward with our inquiries um, on our programme for Europe, but also specifically on the TTIP stuff. And I think we may be relying on Mr Martin very greatly to, to feed us some information that they, we need to inform our work here. But again, on behalf of the committee, can I thank you all for, for, for coming along this morning and I now close this meeting. Thank you. <laughs>